What a day already. I'm so blessed to be here. I'm so glad that you all decided to join us. My name is Elliot. My wife, Tip, and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. Give it up for yourselves because you are amazing. You are. And if you are here for your very first time or visiting kind of newish, let's give it up for all of our visitors today. Let's go. Hey. You're just family that we don't know super well yet, and, but we're going to fix that. We're going to work on that online. We love you. God bless you. So grateful that we have the technology to do that um, for you and so that we can join you online. We have a mission here at the church. Say it with me if you know it, is to be a lifeline by leading people, becoming lifelong followers of Jesus. There's an app called the YouVersion Bible app. If you want to follow along with all the notes, uh, any of the fill in the blanks, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for notes today. I hope you're excited about taking notes. I don't know. Maybe you are, maybe you're not. Either way, you can follow along with the YouVersion Bible app, go to the events tab, find Lifeline Church, and you'll be able to follow along. And there's even some paper copies of these notes. You can get those. I don't know if you know about this, but they're there. They're available to follow along. It's going to be wonderful. We are in part two of this series called Legacy. Legacy is bigger than you think it is. This is a very, very important topic for every single one of our lives. And it's not just financial. I know we talk a lot about money during this series. We like to get on the front end of any kind of financial talk before the holidays come. Amen, everybody? Because I'm not trying to minister to people about their money after they're already broken up to their eyeballs in debt. I'd rather get on the front end of that and not see that happen to you. But this is not simply a financial series. This is an everything series. This is a sowing and reaping series series. This is about you will harvest what you plant series. Listen to what Galatians 6 says. Do not be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. What that means is if you invest in your relationships, those relationships will get better. If you invest in your, in your spouse by bringing home flowers or by bringing home a gift, or in my case, bringing home caffeine, amen, everybody. If I bring home caffeine, my relationship with my wife is going to grow. You understand how that, sowing and reaping, sowing and reaping. It is a common practice for me today to bring home caffeine and it works, everybody. Men, you just write, start with the right there. That's your first note of the day, bring home some caffeine. What that means, sowing and reaping, if you invest in your health, it's going to get better. If you start eating better, exercising more, you're going to be healthier. This is not rocket science. This is actually pretty easy to understand, but this is a God principle. That which you sow, you will also reap. If you invest in your retirement account, I mean, this is, this is simple stuff. Kids, listen up. Invest in a retirement account. If you're in your 20s and you can start doing this now, I'll be borrowing money from you before you know it. It's going to be awesome for me. <laughs> but here's the principle. Now, here's where it really gets, here's where it really gets exciting. Here's, here's where you're at church today. You're not at some financial seminar. You're at church today. So I, I need to tell you something really special about this principle of sowing and reaping. If you invest in the kingdom of God, everything will grow. Every area of your life will give. If you seek first the kingdom of God, Jesus said it himself. He said it in, in Matthew 6. He said, seek the kingdom of God. Invest in the kingdom of God. Pour yourself into the kingdom of God. Above all else, live righteously, and he will give you everything that you need. Amen, everybody? So this is like a one-stop shop. You invest in the kingdom of God, all the areas are going to get better because this is a universal principle, legacy. I want to tell you about it. So one thing we do every single year is called a legacy offering, and it's not today. It's actually in a couple weeks on November 20th. This year, I, I'd love for us to come together as a church, and we're going to focus on something called More Seats, More Souls. Come on, somebody. I came up with such the coolest name for this one. More Seats, More Souls. All right, now, you are, if you've been here for longer than six weeks, you know that these chairs are kind of new that you're sitting in, because I watched a lady who's not a bigger woman. She sat down in a chair and broke it, and I was like, no no, no, never again. And so we got rid of our old chairs and we, we already knew we wanted to get new chairs, more chairs, fill up the house with chairs. But I, we just, I, I couldn't rest knowing that someone might get injured on these desperately old chairs that have been here for like 40 years. No kidding, no kidding. So the church stepped out in faith and we bought as many as we have right here, 150 of them. We have enough room in this in the, we have enough space in this room for 176. These chairs are about $70 a piece. That comes out to roughly $12,000. It was a big step of faith for us. We wanted the church to come together on this for obvious reasons, but we stepped out in faith, but there's still room for more. There's room for more chairs. We, could, we didn't even get them all. So each chair, $70. What I'm asking you to do, just pray about, consider. On the 20th, we're going to all come together. It's going to be a very special day. 
And I would like you to think about how many chairs should I be responsible for? How many souls that'll be sitting in these chairs for generations to come? Maybe you can do one chair. Like I'm good for one chair. Pastor, I'm going to bring 70 bucks and I got enough for one chair. And this chair is going to sit right here in this and somebody might get saved in that seat. Maybe you're good for five. Maybe you're good for 10. I don't know. We're all in different places in life, but it's special when the church comes together to do something together, right? That's going to be on the 20th. Don't miss it. And if those busted out chairs lasted for four generations, I just imagine how many people could be blessed and be served sitting on the chairs that we can fill up this house with. Amen, everybody? Amen. Amen. So who likes driving late at night? Anybody? You are dangerous. You are absolutely reckless. I cannot believe I did not expect that for one second. Anybody to say yes to that. Driving late at night is a recipe for me dying. I cannot believe I lived this long. But back early on in my salvation, back when I first got saved and first moved to town, and was working a couple jobs, waiting tables, I used to go back and visit my uh, oldest son. He's almost 19. I love him so much. So back in the day, I used to have to travel back to Yuba City, where I'm from, to see him. And I was done working a late shift at night, you know, waiting tables, busy. It's like nine o'clock. I get my stuff ready and come on, everybody. I was young. So I had my laundry in the back seat. Going to do my laundry at my parents' house. Come on. <laughs> Who's been there? You know what it feels like. And I'm driving. I'm, and so I'm going north of Sacramento. And if you've ever driven late at night north of Sacramento, you know, it's a great place to take a nap. Great place. It is so quiet. Oh, the, the heater's on, and I'm playing like Dream Theater up in my car. You don't even know what that's about. It's heavy metal up in there, and I'm just like, anything to stay awake, right? And I'm cruising, and I'm like, oh, yeah. Mm, I'm going to make, I'm going to see my family. I'm like getting a little tired, and then, boom! You know those little bumps. I like to call them sleeper strips. The sleeper strips saved my life more than once. The bumps on the side of the road, I call them sleeper strips, to make it clear whether you know you are on track or not. Okay, today I want to talk to you about sleeper strips that I want you to put up in your own life so that you will know whether you are on track or not with some of the most important areas of your life. And those sleeper strips on the side of the road, that's called having a budget, baby. We're going to talk about budgeting today. Someone said sleeper is right. I cannot believe I only come to church once every six weeks. And the one time I decide to come, he's going to talk about budgeting? You have got to be kidding me. I should have watched online. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Should have like, oh yeah, I watch you online, especially when it's about budgeting. No, 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 no. This is actually going to be, I think, very helpful. Very, very helpful because we're not only going to talk about finance, we're going to talk about time. We're going to talk about how you can budget your time to make sure that you are on track in life. Some of you are just yawning thinking about this, and I get it. I get it. You like to go off-road, baby. Man, sleeper strips or not, man, I'm going off-road. I got all-terrain tires. I'm I'm an artist, baby. Leave me alone. I'm going where the Spirit leads me. Okay. (laughs) Oh man, budgeting is for losers. I know what you're thinking. I know, I know because I are one. I know because I kind of, I'm an artist too. I'm an artist too, but I'm married to an accountant. Come on, somebody. It's a good day to be alive. Have you ever heard the term um, starving artist? You ever heard that term? Have you ever heard the term starving accountant? Of course you haven't, because there's no such thing as a starving accountant, because they know how to manage their money. They they know how to not to run out. Artists, man, would just be like, oh, yeah, I got that. Oh, yeah, I got that. I'm going to just drift over here. I'm just going to float over here. And yeah, I got money. Yeah, (laughs) sure you do. For now, you do. I'm an artist uh, married to an accountant, and I'm so glad that I am, because God has something to say about diligence, responsibility, and careful planning. He really does. Let me, I want you to hear this. What you don't manage well will get lost or squandered away. Anything that you don't, it's, it's sowing and reaping. Anything you don't manage well, you name it, that's what it is. You, it'll get lost. If you don't manage it well, it will get lost. Everybody I know in the whole world wants more time and money. I've never met anybody who would honestly admit they want, you know, I just got too much money. This is, this is a real drag. This is a real bummer, Pastor. I'm trying to figure out what to do. Just too much money. 
too much money, uh, you know, and way too much time. You know, I have so much free time, Pastor. I don't know what to do. That, that, those are not complaints I hear very often for counseling. Because um, in this culture, in this era, we always seem to have less and less of those things. You work hard, yet you're still stretched financially. You, you try to plan the day, but then one thing happens, and then you're off schedule for the rest of the day, late for everything. Let me just tell you something. This, this is a tension in life that you will always have to manage. Always. This is not a problem that will just go away. This is something that you have to get comfortable managing on a regular basis. This is a tension in your life, no matter who you are, no matter how long you've been doing this, that will, that will be just a tension that you get to wrestle with all the time. Praise the Lord. Are you feeling encouraged yet? I'm going to have to deal with this always. Thank you so much. Me, let me just tell you something about me. Um, I was asked to be a pastor after a you know, Pastor Tiffany was asked to be a pastor, and they're like, oh yeah, Elliot too, you can try this. And so I really did marry up spiritually, and then Tiffany was doing all the preaching, she was the only pastor, and then they asked me to, to help out, and I was very honored, but I was still kind of young. I had come from a background of addiction and recovery, and I had never really had to focus so greatly, because in this, even in my own, I'm just going to get transparent with you, is there's no one looking over my shoulder. Like, I have about 150 bosses Everywhere, you know, I'm trying to make everybody happy and do different things, but there's nobody like watching me and making sure that I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing while I'm supposed to be doing. I've had to face this reality of managing my time and managing my resources all, to this day. To this day, we still have to manage our time and manage our resources on a regular basis. Every month, we go back to these things and we have to get, get back on track. The best godly thing budgeting does is it forces us to decide what's important. If you are taking notes, write that down. Write that down. If you're not taking notes, write it down. All right, take your phone out. You all have notebooks in your pocket. All right, write it down. Budgeting is about priorities. Budgeting forces us to look at what's important in my life. What am I, what am I gonna choose to focus on? It's too easy to accidentally spend your time. It's too easy to accidentally spend all your money where you didn't intend, leaving no room for the things deep down in your spirit you really wanted to do. Because these things will accidentally fly away. They really will. Listen to what Jesus has to say on the matter. Luke 14, for who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Now, let me tell you something about a rhetorical question. This is a rhetorical question that Jesus is asking. It's a rhetorical question looks like, what were you thinking? Has anyone ever asked you, what were you thinking? They don't want to know what you're thinking. You know what I'm saying? They, they're telling you, you weren't thinking. This is a rhetorical question, and Jesus is saying, who would do that? And what he's saying is, no idiot would do that. But the truth is, all of us do it. All of us do it to an extent. We all spend things on accident. We all one-click our way into trouble. One-click check out our way into trouble. We all scroll a little bit longer than we intended to. Every single one of us does this. We all do this. And here's the big deal. Uh, this isn't simply about money. This isn't simply about um, time management. When Jesus brought up this topic and said, you got you to plan, you got to prepare, this was about following Jesus with your whole life. Let me explain, because I'm going to go back to the scripture, I'm going to read the whole context now. And you'll recognize this verse now, is because in Luke 14, just backing up one verse, if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. Did you know that that was the context of this? You probably didn't. You maybe not remember that this whole life, your whole life of following Jesus is you better sit down and calculate the cost and be ready to get okay with the fact that everything belongs to him. Don't begin until you count the cost. Who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money and everyone would laugh at you. That's a weird thing to say, but he's saying the world is going to witness how well you manage yourself. As a Jesus follower, they are watching you. And they're either going to be inspired or they're going to, be, they're going to think it's hilarious. And then a couple verses later, it says this, so you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Man, 
And this does not mean what you might think it means at first. This does not mean you're supposed to get all your money in a pile and burn it. (laughs) Thank God. That's not what this means. He's not saying you need to give it up, like burn it, just like smoke it up into a big offering, okay? No, this means submit. This means submit until you're able to submit everything you own under my authority, under my authority. Big difference between just giving it all away and submitting it. Being a Jesus follower means this. Every bit of my time and money belongs to God. All of it. Every single bit of it. Because I've calculated the cost and Jesus said that. You need to sit down and calculate the cost to bear your cross and say, everything you own, all of your time. Jesus said to Peter, let down your nets. Just just leave them on the shore. Come with me. And in another time, he says, cast your net out again. And he made him very wealthy in one moment. You see, Jesus will show us how to use our wealth. As long as we submit to him, everything will work out. As long as we have our priorities in him, these things will work out. You don't need to starve. You can have nice things. Many wealthy people honor God with their resources, and you can too. It's all about counting the cost and keeping your priorities in line. Budgeting is foundational to a Christian life. Write that down for me, please. Go ahead. Go ahead. Do it right now. Foundational. You might not know it. You might not want to admit it. You might not want to think about this, but I'm telling you, it's foundational to being a Christ follower. Jesus commands us to live this way. This is not a suggestion. Some people think about following Jesus, and they're that artist, you know? They're like me. It's like, wherever the wind blows, God is just going to pick me up by the shoulders and just drift me over here, and then I'm going to be in meditation, and then he's going to drift me over here, and it's like, no. man. Some people have totally given up on the idea of planning strategy, and being careful and using the noggin that God gave us to actually think through our days and honor God with how we're doing. You know what I'm saying? So Proverbs 24, this is the book of wisdom. Book of wisdom, Proverbs 24. Do your planning and prepare your fields before you build your house. Before you build your house. And let me tell you something about the word house here. In the Old Testament and back in that culture, your house was everything. And it represented your family as well, like the house of Jesse. You know, this is talking about your whole genealogy. Your house meant everything. So when he's talking about building, your, before you build your life, you could just replace it. Do your planning and prepare your fields before building your house, before building your life. Our lives built like a house with foundations. And there's another place Jesus talks about building a house on a foundation. Maybe you've heard of it before. And Jesus talks about choosing the foundation, like being careful and thoughtful about where and how you decide to build your life. You'll know it after I read it, Matthew 7. He said, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds a house on a rock, though the rains come in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse. He's talking about your life. He's not talking about your dwelling. He's talking about your life. Your whole life will remain standing. Your whole life, if you choose to build on a sturdy, solid foundation and choose a foundation, which is Jesus, and he will teach you how to live the rest of your life in every area. Can someone say amen? This is good stuff. I am preaching about 87% better than you are responding to it right now. This is good. This is good. I'm going, what is, Adam, would you go and uh, spice them up a little bit? Let's go. Glory. Glo- glory. <laughs> oh my God. Glory. Glory. If you want finances that, my point is this, if you want finances that won't collapse, if you want a calendar that won't leave you burning the candle on both ends, if you want to live a life that honors God, learn that budgeting is of the Lord. And it's foundational to a Christian life. It really, really is. So what should we do? Today is your day. I am going to show you how to do this. I have had, I got a lot of experience in this area because like I said, I was not, I had to learn as an adult. I had the crash course situation and I've learned this stuff and I want to pass on to you, Lifeline Church, everything that I can squeeze in to the next 20 minutes and give it to you, package it up so that you don't have to go through some of the problems that that we went through. We struggled with going through this and learning how to do this. So I, wanna, I want you to leave unrestrained time, unrestrained resources behind, and, and where should we find our answers? Beneath your feet. 
I saw some people look beneath their feet just now. <laughs> I'm, talking about, I'm talking about the ants. I'm talking about the ants. You're like, what, what, there's ants in here? No, no, the Bible is talking about ants, and that's what we're supposed to drive our wisdom from. In fact, the whole title of this message for my own records is Lessons from the Ants. Lessons from the Ants. Out of Proverbs 6, the book of wisdom. Listen to this. Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Now, I wouldn't talk to you like that. I wouldn't. You sluggard. I would never say that to you. I don't think you're a sluggard. I think you're the best church in the whole Sam King Valley. But this guy is like, you lazy. What are you thinking? Look at the ants, you lazy bone. Learn from their ways and become wise. Though they have no prince or governor to make them work, they labor hard all summer, gathering food in the winter. This is a timing issue. Gathering food in the winter and having, or oh, gathering in the summer, excuse me, I jumped ahead. Gathering in the summer for the winter, okay? And, and how long will you sleep on this issue? That's just, I kind of just plugged that in. This is the new Elliot version now. How long are you going to sleep on this principle? That's what he meant. Not how long literally are you going to be in bed. It sounds like he's talking to his teenage son right now. How can you sleep until 1 p.m.? I don't understand, but I have been a teenager and I do know what that feels like. It feels so good. I wish I could do that now. When will you wake up? Like, when will you wake up to the truth of this fact? When will you wake up to the truth of this principle? A little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Oh, just one more minute. Oh, just one more minute. It's like rolling over. Ten. Thank you, Steve Jobs. He gave me 11 minutes. Every time I push snooze on my iPhone, it's 11 minutes. Oh, that's going to make me feel refreshed. Oh, just 11 more minutes and I'm going to be energized. Okay. Okay. 11 minutes is going to do it. But he says this, a little folding of the hands to rest and poverty will pounce on you like a bandit and scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. Now, obviously he's talking to his teenage son here. In fact, in the book of Proverbs, he says, listen to my commands, my son. So he is talking to younger people. But I think those of us that are a certain age, some of us who are older can still benefit from this. I mean, think about this. No one's following ants around, telling them what to do. They just do it. They wake up and they keep on grinding until nighttime. They sleep a little bit and then they're back up grinding again. Learn a lesson from the ants. Ants are smart. Timing is important. I heard this saying in a book that kind of like paints the picture another way. Um, you can't fix a leak in the roof when it's raining outside. But in the summer when it's sunny, you don't need to fix your roof. Cool. You see what I'm saying? You need to do things ahead of time to keep yourself, your family, the next generation safe. And that's what building a budget is all about. That's what, that's what organizing your life around a calendar, around just actually having some management, some stewardship over your own life. That's what this is about, is planning and preparing in the summer for the winter. Amen, everybody? Time and money are the two principles I want to talk to you about today. The first one is your resources. Budget your resources. Just budget them. Here, we're going to talk about this right now. When people talk about budgets, this is almost always what they mean. And the Bible talks about it like this. I'm going to read you a confusing verse, a couple of verses, but I'm going to explain it to you. I'm going to explain it to you. Don't you worry one bit. I'm going to break it all down. Proverbs 27. Listen to this. Again, this is Solomon giving wisdom to his son. He says, know the state of your Flocks. Now, any word that's highlighted, just go ahead and say it with me, all right? I'll read nice and slow so you can keep up. Know the state of your? And put your heart into caring for your? For riches don't last forever. And don't, you don't have to read this whole big part. <laughs> and the crown might not be passed to the next generation. Remember, we're in a series about legacy. We're talking about passing on to the next generation. Your sons, your daughters, your nieces, your nephews, the people that you care about. After the hay is harvested and the appears in the are gathered in mountain grasses okay and your sheep is it highlighted I don't even know it's bold for me your sheep will provide wool for clothing and your goats you should have said goats did I highlight that one your goats will provide the extra price of a field and you will have enough goats milk like okay what is go what in the Sam Hill are we talking about we're all supposed to drink goats milk now is that what's going on no let me explain this let me explain this Solomon is explaining to his son that you should know and understand every single category of expense in your life. 
every single category of income that goes to an expense. You, it's your job, my son. It's your job, my son, to, to understand where your money's going. Some of you already know this, some of you already do this, but some of you absolutely do not. And I want, I, w- I want to help you today. I want to change that today. Let, let's put up this really, I want, you to, I want your brain to explode right now, so I want you to go ahead and put up this next slide right here. Here we go, three, two, one, there it is. There it is. Some of you need to pull out your phone right now and take a, this wonderful wheel of color is called a budget, everybody. <laughs> And if you're online, it's right here for you. This is a budget. And, if, and I can't believe they don't teach this stuff in school. Maybe they're starting to. And I also can't believe we don't talk about this stuff in church. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to change this right now. So I'm going to do as quick as I can. I'm going to break down some of the more important areas of this. Leave this up for me, Joshua, just as long as you can. I don't know who's up there. It's so dark in here. Somebody, whoever's up there, God bless you. Just leave it up till we move on. The first area I want to talk about, and I'm going to, I'm going to walk over here real quick, is this area right here, giving. Giving right here. For a Christ follower and for my wife and I, this is the first area we budget. We budget our giving First, you'll see it says 10 to 15%. We do 10% and then we do another little bit that we like to give. Amen. Right there. I heard it. I heard the camera flash. Come on, let's give it up for them right there. They're going to learn how to budget. Amen. Amen. I was waiting. I was hoping. I was praying that somebody would want to do this. Now, what we do is we budget it first because if we budget, I, I just know this about us. If we budget our giving last, there definitely won't be room for it in our budget. You budget giving lasts, and it just has a way of going, oh, man, I definitely don't have room for that. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, as a Christ follower, if you're trying to follow Jesus, maybe you're new at it, or maybe you're not new at it, but you're new to this. You're new to budgeting your life like this. I'm telling you to budget your giving. Budget your tithe. And if, you're, if you struggle with that, and I don't know, when I was young in the Lord, I just read it in the Bible, and I didn't have much at the time, and I just jumped on board both feet and said, you know what, this is what I'm going to do, and I would tithe off of my, my, uh, my tip money. You know, I'd be tithing like $8.48, you know, I rounded up to nine. I was like the most spiritual person in the room right there, made 90 bucks, tithed $9, and that was just it. It was easy for me, but I know something about pastoring for a while. This is not always easy. This is, this is not easy, and I, and I don't... I'm not saying it should be easy, and if it's not, it doesn't feel easy, then you're broken. I'm not saying that at all. In fact, we're a weird church. I talked about this last week, that we do something called the tithe challenge here. And this is the only area in all of Scripture that God says, you can test me. You, every other place in the Bible, he says, you better not test me. Don't test me, the Lord says. But in this one area, in Malachi 3.10, he talks about it, breaks it all down, says, you can put me to the test in this area. Tithe in the Bible, means one-tenth part, means 10%. And what you can do is, is read that scripture. It's on the little cards in the seat back in front of you, and the scripture's right there. And I had someone come up to me last week, and they said, Pastor, I don't need this. Man, I'm just going to trust the Lord. And I was like, okay, praise God. You're good. All right, cool. But it's not like that for everyone. I understand this, that it might be a challenge. So what we do, and like I told you, we're a funky church. We don't, we don't mind making it like we'll guarantee it. We'll guarantee it. Like, when this is the honor system, we're not going to look at your finances or nothing. You just put your name on there and put when you're going to start. And whatever you give for the next three months, if God doesn't show up for you, we'll all be returned to you. All of it. Because we just know. We believe. We know that God will come through in this area. Because this is the, amen. This is the one area that actually, ble- no other budgeting move will bless the rest of your finances. If you can get this part right, it will unlock spiritual blessing in your life. But I'm lingering on this too long. Let, I just wanted to let you know that card is there. The tithe challenge card is there for you if you need it, if you want it. Do not be embarrassed. Take that sucker out and say, you know what, I'm going to go for it. You know, because what do I have to lose? Absolutely nothing. Huh. Go for it. Go ahead and do it. Oh, man, too much coffee. My bad. So savings is next. Um, Put 10% of your savings away until you get a nice little month or two of expenses. And if there's not enough room, I'm going to get to this. I'm going to explain what to do. After you've saved up enough for a month or two of expenses, then you can begin to invest and the other things can go up there. I hope you took the picture of it because it's gone. The next are your fixed bills, your housing, your food, your insurance, your personnel, personnel, personal expenses, transportation, even yearly stuff like your car registration. 
It's amazing to me how many people go, oh man, car registration, it always comes at a bad time. Amen. What are you talking? It comes at the same time every year. <laughs> it's like the DMV is like waiting. They're like, hey, it's time to send out this, this, uh, this, uh, the DMV registration to uh, Mr. Adam over here. And they're like, no, 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 let's wait. Let's wait. Let's wait until he's in a really tight spot. And then we'll FedEx it to him. No, they don't care. They're just in the, the only reason it's a bad time is because you haven't been putting $15 a month all year long. So it's just paid when it comes. Uh, there's another thing that's coming, Christmas. Do you have hundreds of dollars or however much you need set aside right now? It should be almost full by now. Your, your uh, expenses for Christmas. I'm not trying to make you hurt. I'm not trying to make this bad. I'm trying to just let you know. That's why you think you can afford Starbucks every day. It's because, I'm being serious, like that's why you think you have more money than you do because some of these other bills that you haven't sat down, worked with, if money's tight, you got one or two problems. Let me tell you, um, the one or two problems is this. Number one, and this is nine out of 10 people, and this is as hardcore as I'm gonna be today, is, is probably overspending. When Tiffany and I started budgeting our money, I realized that I was spending an exorbitant amount of money on eating out. I had no idea I was spending so much money on Taco Bell was the reason I wasn't investing in my future. Taco Bell. But I had no idea. Someone's giving me some praise hands right there. I'm like, yeah, I know. It's hard. It's crazy. But until we sat down and actually built a budget, we, we, we didn't know. We didn't realize because it has a way of just sliding away. That's the number one offender. Build a budget and then you'll find out. Like, I'm overspending in some areas. I cut the cable, go to Netflix. I'm going to stop eating out so much. I'm going to start doing my grocery shopping. You'll feel like you got a raise just because of that. Problem number two is maybe you don't have enough income. And I'm giving you permission as your pastor to go out and get a side hustle. Go ahead. I've done it as a pastor. I've worked on steel buildings. I've went out and uh, demoed houses. I actually rang bell for the Salvation Army for minimum wage early on. You want to know why I did that? So I'd have Christmas money for my family. Early on, we didn't have enough. And so I had to get up off of my butt and go ring the bell, and people would see me out there. And they're like, oh, it's so nice of you to volunteer for the Salvation Army. I was like, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. I didn't correct them or anything because, you know, it's a little embarrassing. It is embarrassing sometimes to go out and get a side job, and you, people are, you feel like people are judging you. Who cares? Who cares what they say? If you are truly not overspending, I'm giving you permission. Right? Go, go ahead. Go out and get you a little side something and generate a little more revenue so that you can have the things that you want to have in life and do the things you want to do in life. Hardworking Christians are a light in the world. It's a good thing, okay? Um, it's, I'm going to skip that part. Next year, I didn't have to ring, money, ring the bell after that. It was really a blessing because after I did that, it's like God smiled on us and something shifted in our finances. And as I was willing to work, he came through. It was really wonderful. Be wise, work hard, follow Jesus, make a financial plan. Let your finances be a testimony to wisdom of following Jesus. Last thing is this, budget your time. This is the thing that not a lot of people talk about, but it's so important. It's so important because this one's a lot harder because you just can't go and work for more time. You can't go and get a side job to buy more time in life. We all have the same 24 hours in a day being taken from us one second at a time. And it is, it's, it's a lot harder to manage this. Um, listen to what Ephesians 5 has to say. This is Paul writing. He said, therefore, consider carefully how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of the time because these days are evil. These days, it is easier than ever to waste a day. Did you know this? Have you ever heard of TikTok in your life? Oh my goodness gracious. I discovered TikTok like a month ago. I lost like a whole day of my life. A whole day of my life went bye-bye looking at cooking videos. I was, I was like, this is amazing. But this is, the, this is the kind of, because now there is a booming industry of attention gathering. There is a huge, booming industry. It is so easy to waste time and not even know it. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. Okay, news channels, uh, constantly checking emails. I mean, it's not even the things you think. Sometimes the things you don't even realize are wasting time. You're just always checking back and always interrupting work with it. Let me check email again. You already checked it like two minutes ago. <laughs> Some of you are, you know exactly what I'm talking about because you pick up your phone and look at it like every three minutes. <laughs> I know because I do it too. 
And I have to wake up to what the Bible says, man. It, sports, oh, I don't even want to talk about sports, man. It's football season up in here. Let's go. Man, some of you are here watching, listening to me when you could be watching, uh, you know, it's a little bit of football, and I'm thinking God is going to bless you for it. But Paul tells us, consider carefully. Be wise. Make the most of your time. How? I'm going to make this super simple. This is how you do it. You need to create a time budget. And the first thing you need to budget in your time is the Lord. You need to budget God into your time. Some of this feels so mechanical to some of you. But let me just tell you, the world is out to get your attention and it is begging for it. it. The world would love you to open up Facebook first thing in the morning. The world would love you to open up your email first thing in the morning. So what I always recommend when I'm discipling someone, when someone wants to know what to do, I always tell them you put God first. Put it first in your day. Put it in your calendar if you have to. Like if you live off a calendar, put it there. Make it first. Make him first. And everybody in, in the whole world has 15 minutes to spare. If you don't, then you just need to look again. You've got 15 minutes. You can wake up 15 minutes earlier and do what we call the first 15. That's what we call around here. And especially if you're new to this, if you're new to following Jesus, if you're new to coming to church, and even if you've been coming to church a long time, but no one ever told you, you ought to be doing this. Put God first in these three areas. Give him five minutes of reading the Bible, five minutes of prayer, and five minutes in worship. It'll change your day, and it'll change all of your days. It'll change your life. Put him first. Five minutes in the Bible. <clears throat> Excuse me. Allergy season. Not anything else. Just allergy. <laughs> I'm like still nervous about that. Put him first with reading the word. That's like one chapter. Two if you're fast at it. But like one chapter, read it slow. Like just let it soak into you. Read a chapter of your Bible. And then five minutes in prayer. Let me tell you how easy this is. Just ask, uh, thank God for everything you could think of. Thank God for everything you could think of. Everything that comes to your mind, thank him. And then ask him for everything you could think of. Thank him for everything you think of. Ask him for everything you think of. Five minutes will fly, trust me. Next thing is this, is, is worship. I know what we did here was amazing. This worship team, can we give it up for this worship team? Oh my goodness. It's like right before my eyes, I'm in like, I'm like elevation, forget them. I'd rather come to Lifeline. This is awesome. I love it here. And they're doing, but this is, this is, we're supposed to experience that every day. We're supposed to experience uh, offering our, our praise and, and glory to God. We're supposed to encounter him like that every single day. And just listen to one worship song. Believe me, it'll change everything. Uh, but do, do what works for you. If you can't put him first, and I, I'm believing you might be able to, but Put him somewhere, put him somewhere in your life. Time budget next is your family. Budget your family into your time. Men, I'm talking to you. Especially, well, women too, women too, but it's, it's men, hardworking men out there. Love to win in life, love to build careers, love to build wealth. Men, listen up. Budget your family. And between five o'clock and eight o'clock, that's family time. That is my family's time. I'm not going to be on YouTube. I'm not going to be on Facebook. I'm not going to be watching the news. This is time where I'm connecting with my spouse. That's time where I'm connecting with them. And this one, you do it when they're available. Okay, it's like six in the morning. You're like, all right, family time. They're not awake, bro. They're not awake. You're going to have to do it when it works for them. But I'm telling you to actually budget your family into your life. I know that might sound cold, but I'm telling you, if you're not doing it, if you haven't done it, it's easy for it not to happen. You understand? Budget, time budget, church. By time budget, church. This is not a recommendation. God said, do not forsake the assembling yourselves together. And it is amazing to me that the global statistics right now, well, national, excuse me, not global. Overseas is different. But in, in, in our country, it's, the average is like one in six. Sundays, people come to church. That is crazy to me. I can't, I can't imagine how I would live my life not getting filled up, not getting encouraged. And, and maybe you, you know it's right, but you know, life happens. You wake up and the Raiders are playing prime time and you're like, man, I'm not going to miss that. I want to see them lose again. I just have to see it. My bad. My bad. Hey, <laughs> But if it's not planned into your lifestyle, if it's not planned into like, you know, I go to church Sunday mornings. Like if it's not built in, it's easy to wake up on a Sunday morning and say, ah, oh, man, I'll get there next week. I'll watch online. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not picking on you online. I'm not. I'm not trying to. I'm just saying budgeting this 
is just like budgeting anything else. If you don't do it, it's amazing how it just slips away. The best way to budget church into your life and create those sleeper strips on the side to make sure you're on track is to go through our growth track. It's today. It's after church. Just come on through. Step one, Tiffany and I will answer any questions you have about the church. We'll break it down for you, and we'll let you serve on our dream team, and you can serve on a schedule. Some teams serve every three weeks, some every other week, some serve every week. Really, it's up to you. You can serve as often as you want, but once you're a part of the team, it's really easy. It becomes a lot easier to say, this is my church. This is where I go. It's what I'm doing. It's all good, and for some of you, that is the missing piece. Like really, that's, all, that's the only thing missing. Everything else is stellar, but just that commitment level to the church. I'm ready to, we're ready to meet you there after church today. Come through Growth Track and we'll sit with you for 45 minutes. We're on a time budget as of right now. 45 minutes and we'll get you right off to lunch. It'll be great. Last thing, time budget your work. Some of you work from home. You got to budget that stuff. Don't let your work consume you at home. Some of you clock into your work. When you clock in, leave your phone over. All right, be a light in the darkness and actually focus on your work while you're there. Some, of, <laughs> some people are surprised to know that I draft my messages by Tuesday. By Tuesday. I'm done with drafting. I still work on it a little bit, but I'm done. Why? Because I want to spend time with my family. And I don't want to be stressed out all week thinking about what I'm going to say. So I budget my time to do my work when I can. And a lot more people in the world are on, ha- on their own schedule, so they need to do it. Um, budgeting in all of these areas is a lot like those sleeper strips. It's a lot like having parameters in your life. I want to show this to you so you'd never forget it, okay? Having a budget ah, is like having a pile of anything, you know? I think of my son who's about to turn 19. We used to play Monopoly together, and he would have all of his money in a straight-up pile. (laughs) And it was like a mountain of money. He had 500s and 50s and whatever, and it was just everywhere. And he, he would like land on boardwalk and I'd be like, do you have enough money to buy boardwalk? He's like, I don't know. I'm not sure. He had no idea how much he had. When you build a budget, when you actually focus on this and take the time to build a budget, it's like building a parameter like sleeper strips, not only over your finances, but also over your time. Look, I know how many I have. They're right here. One, two, 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 two. I know how much I have to work with. I know how much I can give away. I know how much I can spare. I know how much more I need to fill up the capacity that I have. I believe God honors the having of a budget with your time, with your resources, with everything. What do you think it looks like to not have a budget in your life? Same amount of resources, same amount, 24 hours that that everyone else has, same amount of money. But it's like you just took the walls off, spilled it all. Okay, I don't need this. I don't need none of that. How much money do you have, Elliot? Oh, I got some over there. I don't know, I got some over here. Don't lose those. I need to return those to Walmart because I'm on a budget. I'm on a budget. $75 worth of balls right here. Not having a budget is like, it's unrestrained time. It's like, how much time do you have? Do you have time to meet with me, pastor? I don't even know. I don't know how much time I have. I don't know. Pastor, do you have $50 so that you can spare, you know, for this guy? I don't, I don't, I think so. I'm not sure. When you don't plan your life, and as a Christ follower, we are called to plan our lives. When we don't have a budget, when we don't have things set aside, we don't know how much we have to work with. But when we begin to put God's principles in our life, let's see if I can do it. Oh, no, I'm not cool like that. We begin to, and Maybe you're feeling kind of guilty. You don't have one. You just start somewhere and begin to put them, some things in line. Begin to schedule some of the time you have. Begin to put some things in order. Begin to budget your giving. Budget your, the amount of entertainment you're spending on. Budget the amount of fast food you're eating. God will bless and he will increase your capacity because that which a man sows, he will also reap. If you sow good management, good stewardship, God is going to bless your life. Things will improve in any area that you track, God will bless. Because it's the principle of sowing and reaping. It's universal. And let me just tell you something about, let me just get personal with you. When Tiffany and I started doing this, it was really tough. Honestly, it it was very tough. Like, we had a lot of fights when we started budgeting our stuff. Like, we were already pastors 
I'm sorry, Tiffany, I didn't, I didn't get permission, but I'm not going to say like how bad they were, but it was like, it was bad enough to where it's like, it, it was really tough. You understand, like when, you, when we went to go build a budget, it made our insecurities come to the surface. It, may, it forced us to look at our priorities that were kind of laying under the surface that we didn't know. It, it, it forced us to look at our differing priorities, especially if you're a married person. And it forced us to look at our insecurities that we had about money. That wasn't a bad thing though. We had to get over it. I'm, I'm just telling you, it might be hard at first for you to start doing this in your life, but the benefits are incredible. Like now we're able to give so freely. Now we're able to invest into our future. So our kids, they'll have an inheritance from us off of a pastor's salary that doesn't include retirement. Like we're able to do all because we've planned, because we've structured, because we put it together. But it was super hard at first. What I'm asking you to do, church, is overcome the initial pain. Overcome the initial pain because what it does for you is so wonderful. This frees you from stress that you've been dealing with in your life. You've been dealing with the stress of not knowing, not being sure. Some of you earn plenty, but you just don't know where it's going. Some of you have, you have plenty of time. You can, you can invest in a new hobby, a new passion, uh, but you just, your, your time is so all over the place, you just don't know. It's gonna give you a peace of mind. It'll help you build a legacy in your life. You can do this and it'll change the role in your life to a role of leadership towards others. You're gonna be able to help others. I'm helping you and you're gonna be able to help others when you get through this, when you start doing this. You're gonna be able to bless your coworkers, bless your family, bless your kids, be able to teach them to do the same thing. And it's gonna change the capacity of what God gives you and it'll broaden your shoulders for what you're able to carry. But let me just tell you, it's gonna take trust. You're gonna need to step out and trust. You're gonna need to start trusting in God in a new way to do this. And this is the step I know many of you are on. It's the step of trust. To trust God with your finances is one of the most difficult things for some people to do. To budget this way and to put giving in there and to just start to do things God, God's way. There are so many voices that we've grown up with, things that we've been told. It's like we know we ought to, but then there's just something nagging at us. There's gonna be a step of faith and trust because I know I've been very practical all day today, but I wanna to begin to talk to you about faith. I wanna pray for you in a moment that you, would, that you would take the step of faith today, not just over your finances, not just over your time, but just trusting in Jesus. The Bible says in another place in Proverbs, Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Some of you, that is exactly the step you're on. It's time to trust God. It's time to step out and say, God, I, I don't, I've been around, I've known Jesus followers, and I, maybe I used to do, but I'm, I haven't been fully trusting in you. I haven't been fully submitted to you. I haven't been really living my life in a way that would say to the world, I am trusting Jesus with everything. If that's you, today's your day. I wanna give you just a simple opportunity in a moment, just to, just to lift up your heart and say, God, you've been drawing me to this moment and I, I'm, I'm ready to believe in you. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes together. This is a holy moment, sacred moment, so let's not stir too much if we can help it because there are some people that are ready to take that step of trust and this is so much greater, so much bigger than just finances, so much bigger than just, just our resources, so much bigger than just our time management. This is trusting in Jesus with our lives. Some of you are ready to take that step and that is the most important thing you can do is just to say, Lord, wherever I'm at, would you accept me? Lord, whatever I'm struggling with, would you accept me in that? With all of my sin that I've lived in my life, with all of the struggles and hardships I've had, will you still accept me? The answer is yes, he will. He will accept you and he will bring you in and he will begin to transform your life if you can learn to trust in him. That's all you gotta do is trust in him and take a step of faith. So with heads down and eyes closed, I wanna pray a blessing over you and give you the opportunity to respond in faith. Lord, I pray for every heart to be opened today to receive your love, to receive your grace, to receive your salvation. Lord, I pray for every mind to be open, that they would see the, the logic even of, Lord, there is a creator. You are the creator. And I wanna get in line with the creator of the universe, the one that established the heavens 
and the earth, and I want to get in line with his ways. So if that's you today, and if you're ready to come back to the Lord or step out in faith for the first time, or maybe, maybe recommit yourself and say, I'm ready to trust Jesus. If your prayer today, you say, I want to trust Jesus, and I want to give him my heart. Would you just lift your hand right now and say, that's, I, want to, I want to trust him. Go ahead and lift your hand right now. Be bold. Be brave. Amen. I see you. Amen. I see you too. You and you and you. Absolutely. I see every single one of you, but more importantly, God sees your hearts today, ladies and gentlemen. So let's pray this prayer together. Just pray, say it right after me. And if it's from your heart, just say it nice and bold, nice and brave. Just say, Father God, thank you for sending your son to die on a cross for my sin. Help me to trust in you and put all my trust in you. Fill me with your spirit to overflowing. Make me new. Show me the path that I should take. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, can we give it up for the Lord? He is so good. Amen.